Here is an author in their element, having some fun with their karate, delivering some of the best it's combat scenes I've read tale lately. That never wanders far from my mind. I think that this might be one of the single best representations of dragons that I've read in the fantasy genre. This book is a dark, fascinating, disgusting, wonderful, nauseating, intriguing, effed up, heartfelt, brutal character study. And it recaptures the magic of far flung galaxies, grand ideas, and more. There's so much this book gets right. Like any good map, you're aware of the destination it's leading you towards. But the way it takes you there is very pretty indeed. An all-consuming dreamscape, the likes of Poe and Morpheus. It's a neo retro futuristic fest. And this is Dumps like Bostar. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to TBRCon 2023 and the Hidden Gems of Fantasy panel. Uh, so excited to be here. Uh, special thanks and praise to the wonderful Adrian Gibson of SFF Addicts Podcast for facilitating this amazing event, uh, TBRCon 2023. Uh, I'm P.L. Stewart, author and blogger, I'm coming to you from uh, the incredible uh, LaSalle branch of the Essex County Public Library, LaSalle, Ontario, Canada. I relocated residence yesterday and won't have internet till tomorrow. So the library was kind enough to let me a room to broadcast from. So shout out to all the public libraries and thanks so much for all you do. Well, we have an incredible lineup of panel members today, uh, all fabulous authors and can't wait to hear from them as they discuss hidden gems of fantasy. So without further ado, uh, let's start off, start off sorry, with some uh, panel introductions. Um, I'd ask um, if we could go around and have everyone uh, talk a bit about who they are, introduce themselves bit about their writing journey, influences, and perhaps name the work or works, uh, for a lot of you have written multiple books, um, that you believe you're best known for. So I think, uh, again, apologies, it's my clockwise, so Hannah would be would be up first. Me? All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah. I write under H.M. Long, and I am the author of... Hall of Smoke World Series, Hall of Smoke, Temple of No God, and Bear of Winter. Bear of Winter came out last week in the UK and is coming next week in North America. I also have another series starting this year in July called The Winter Sea, and it's opening with Dark Water Daughter. I don't have any arcs or anything yet, so I can't show it off, but the cover is exquisite. Um, I'm a Canadian. I live in a cabin in the bush. Uh, I love to read, if that's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Uh, Alina? Hi, I'm Alina Boyden, and um, I write under Alina Boyden. And I'm not a Canadian, but my best friend and biggest fan is a Canadian, so that's cool. And um, I'm best known for my duology, uh, Stealing Thunder and Gifting Fire. They're a fantasy series which basically asks and answers the question, what would happen if the crown prince of the Mughal Empire decided that um, she wanted to transition? And how would that play out? So yeah, that's me. Phenomenal. Um, Gareth? Hi, uh, I'm Gareth Hanrahan, or Gareth Ryder Hanrahan, depending on how wide the spine of the book is. Uh, I started off and still write uh, many role-playing supplements. I've been working as a role-playing writer for many, many years and have a CV that's you know, longer than I can recall uh, at any time. Um, in terms of novels, I'm probably best known for the Black Iron Legacy series, which is The Gutter Prayer, The Shadow Saint and The Broken God, and a new series starting in May, also for more of it, starting with The Sword Defiant. And that's me. Fantastic. CL. Hi everybody, I'm Sheree, our CL Clark. I have written The Unbroken and coming up soon in March, The Faithless. I'm probably best known for the arms, Terrain's arms and my arms. Um, but I also, um, I also write short stories and essays, which you can find um, various places like Uncanny Magazine, Tor.com. And I also was one of the editors um, at Podcastle.com, a place to listen to and read now some of the most fantastic short fantasy that's being published. Angela. 
Um, hi, I'm Angela Board. Um, I was a finalist in the SPIFO, the self-published fantasy blog off um, five, which um, was 2019 into 2020 with my book, uh, Fortune's Fool, which is the one, um, probably the one that I'm most known for. Uh, Fortune's Fool is the Tyrian Empire series right now. Um, it's book one. I have a novella called Smuggler's Fortune out in it, and book two, Fool's Promise, should be out later this year. Um, it is kind of a twisty, romantic, um, Renaissance-inspired um, fantasy about a woman with a metal arm who um, is kind of on for revenge in the beginning. But um, And then I just brought out a book in another series called through Dreams So Dark, which is more of a kind of an old school portal fantasy epic um, kind of thing and inspired by uh, Cold War politics. Um, and that's me. Ooh, fantastic. And last but certainly not least, uh, Zamil. Hi, I'm Zamil. Uh, I am the author of this book, Gunmetal Gods, uh, which is right now a two-part series the third book will be coming out uh in april i am also the author of light blade which is a very different kind of book it's a progression fantasy uh i would say what what unites all of my works is they all tend to have middle eastern or south asian influences um they all they all sort of have horror elements i'm a big horror writer as well um yeah so that's me Phenomenal. Thanks to all of you for the introductions and uh, sounds all of your works obviously sound fantastic. So um, as you know, this panel is about the hidden gems of fantasy. So I'd like to start off with um, asking the question to the panelists. I mean, essentially exposure to certain works and the claim for certain works, it, it's all relative. Um, however, what do you all think defines a hidden gem as a, as a literary work in fantasy? Like, for example, you know, what are your like your individual subjective benchmarks for something to be considered a hidden gem? And when do you think something ceases to be a, a hidden gem? Like what how do you how do you figure out what a hidden gem is? So love to hear from all of you. If we can kind of go in the same order, that would be that'd be great. Well, I mean, it's my subjective opinion, but I feel like hidden gems are just the books that don't get as much visibility as they deserve. They're the ones that you might personally love and like treasure in your heart, but you never see them on the tables of the bookstores. You never see them on the bookends. You never see them featured anywhere. Um, and they might get some good traction, like right around release and stuff like that. But then they just kind of quiet down and, you know, they have a loyal readership, but not necessarily the visibility that, yeah, that they deserve. So that would be how I would define it. Lena? Yeah, I think a hidden gem is um, <clears throat> is certainly one that that is um, is not as visible as others. But I think sometimes it's not as visible as others because of uh, the audience that it caters to. And so I think that when we talk about um, how most people have traditionally engaged with the the literary market, we're talking about foot traffic in bookstores until you know recently. Now, of course, most people buy things on Amazon. But the problem when you know, and this is well documented with Spotify, when you have a huge number of people suddenly able to put out a bunch of stuff in a medium that doesn't allow you to search well unless you already know what you're looking for, you end up with a situation where the same things, the attention over and over again, and people are actually less likely to try something new than they would be if they had fewer options. And so I think that we actually have a lot more hidden gems in fantasy now because a lot more um, books are out there, but they're also in 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 some ways less accessible because people have um, choice or you know, decision paralysis, and, and they don't have search tools that really let them find the things that maybe cater to them. They see the things that, that get all of the attention instead. Good point. Gareth? Yeah, when, when someone says like hidden gem to me, I, I, I always think like, you know, if you have a big pile of treasure, you've got the gold, which is like, you know, all like, you know, it's lovely to have, gold is good, but it's all like, you know, sort of much the same. And gems and things you sort of pick up and admire individually. So to my mind, a hidden gem is either a standalone book or like if it's part of a series, it's like different to the rest of it. It's something unique. So you put like you know, if you're going to read one book by this author, this is the one book you should read. Um, that's also you, you tend to like sort of 
push onto your friends, even if they like you. I know you don't know read fancy books, but read this one, read this one. I think it's sort of like, you know, it's shiny and full of enthusiasm, but hasn't got the recognition it deserves. What do you think, Seal? So far, I agree um, in a lot of ways with um, what everyone else has said. Um, you definitely have the ones that aren't getting like the massive public push or whatever um, from publishers or from whatever influencer du jour. But um, something else that I was thinking about because of my own, like the books that I would classify as, as hidden gems, um, I don't think, for example, that awards necessarily disqualify um, a book from being a hidden gem because there are like there are so many Hugo Award winning books that I just I've never even heard of and still haven't read um, and also just realizing how insular into the community these awards can be like I mean normal readers who aren't like SFF writers or obsessives probably don't even know what a Hugo is um, so they can still very easily be um, hidden gems and so uh, in some ways, yes, it's just a, a book that I could um, say, hey, have you heard of this book? And someone's like, what? No. Um, so that's some sort of hidden gem qualification. But I also think there's this really interesting phenomenon. Um, whenever an author is like really, really, really well known for one thing, like maybe it's their debut thing or maybe it's the award winning book or trilogy or whatever. And then it's the book right after it's little bit different or it leaves whatever genre or it's not the same characters but even if an author has leveled up in some way or is like really just flexing those artistic muscles it's different so it just kind of gets buried a little bit um it doesn't get the same height because everyone's like i don't know what to do with this different thing and um those are often sometimes to me anyway some of the most interesting works because they have all the experience from the past series, but they're also exploring a different side of themselves. And I think that's like, you know, it's got all the facets, you know, it's so it's very um, just, I really, I really like those, those books. Um, and then you've got like old books too. Like that's kind of part of, of, of treasure is like, it's something that's been buried for a long time. Um, so going back, uh, so yeah, those are kind of my my main categories of hidden gems. Angela, yeah, I I agree with that a lot, and 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 especially I think what resonates with me is like the the community, like the relativeness sometimes of what makes something hidden. Like maybe something is, you know, everybody in a in a certain community knows about it, but if the community is not large enough then then there's still like this whole pool of people out there a pool of readers that haven't actually they don't know about it and to them they're like wow why didn't i hear about this book um being with my experience going through spiffbo it's kind of like that because you hear that term hidden gem tossed around a lot with spiffbo as being like you know because mark lawrence started the contest to promote indie works and, and get the word out about indie books to the larger reading community. And that was specifically kind of what it was meant for is to find, because a lot of people when they come into indie have no idea where to start. They don't even know because it's, you know, it's not, they're not in bookstores. They're just, there's Amazon with millions of titles and where do you start? And so sometimes books can be hyped in the like the indie fantasy community on like a certain you know different social media like twitter or instagram and then you realize that that most people like if you're talking to you know people who are outside of that community they still don't know that it exists there's always like more readers to reach with the book um and for me that i mean that that resonates and then the older books that see i was talking about too that because i grew up reading a bunch of books in the in the 80s i just read down the the sff shelf in the library and um those were big influences on me writers like cj cherry or katherine kerr and now when you mention them to people people are like who because they you know they n nobody 
knows who they are. They're, there's all because there's always more books to read. You know, like I always feel like you're behind on your TBR. There's more and more of them. So, so for me, and when I'm trying to recommend books to people, and I like to find those books that that people don't know about, and I'm really excited about, and I'm like, you no, know, no, really, you have to read this because this is this is really cool. I really enjoyed this. And, and so that's that's part of the fun of reading to me. Okay, and Zamil? Yeah, I would say most indie books and most mid-list trad books I would define as hidden gems. Although the word hidden in that is obviously relative, as Angela mentioned, it all depends on community. But the way I think of it is if I go up to... Um, an average reader, uh, you know, let's say an average reader in, in the U.S., for example, and I ask them, have you heard of this book? Have you read this book? And they've never heard of it even once. They've never read a book probably by the same author. I would still classify that uh, as a as hidden. You know, I don't know about the gem part yet. That depends on whether the book is good or not. But it's definitely hidden. Uh, most people, the books that they see are the ones that um, they'll see passing by on the shelves when they're when they're at the airport or um, when they're at the convenience store. And those are the those are the only books I could say with certainty that are not hidden to any degree. You know, everyone is going to see like the latest Brandon Sanderson novel uh, sitting there, uh, at, at, you know, at, in the airport at I don't know what WH uh, Smith or whatever, whatever the story is called. They'll see it sitting there and. Even if they don't read Brandon Sanderson, they'll see the title, they'll see his name, and that's no longer hidden. You know, everyone's sort of uh, heard of it, and you can go up to someone in the street, and they'll have at least heard his name. They may have heard that, you know, they may know the name of a few books. Um, and we can't really say this for 99% of authors, um, including literally all of, self, uh, of the self-published realm. Um, you don't see any self-published books typically in bookstores, uh, whether Barnes and Nobles or in the airport or, or it's very rare. It does happen. You know, you do see it from time to time, uh, but it's very rare. Uh, and when I when I think about online shopping as well, you know, if you're if you're getting recommendations and emails for certain books and Amazon is really pushing a book that could sort of elevate like an indie book beyond the hidden realm. Uh, where where the average reader might see it and, you know, then I, I would say it's no longer hidden. Um, but for most of us, the challenge is to be less hidden. We don't want to be a hidden gem. We want to just be a gem. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it's the hidden part that is that is just so hard. And it's 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 a spectrum. It's relative. You know, the less hidden we are, the better, I would say. Yes, see yeah. Um, what Zamo said made me re remember kind of like getting kicked in the face, like the biggest thing changing discoverability right now is actually not even airports and convenience stores, but it's movies and television. Those are the only books that non non readers have ever heard of at this point. They've heard of Lord of the Rings, they've heard of The Hobbit, they've heard of some of them are now just finally hearing about The Wheel of Time, you know. Um, and I think that changes discoverability so much, even on bookshelf levels, because there's suddenly no space for any other book because there are 30 copies of Dune and 30 copies of Lord of the Rings and like Brandon Sanderson and then like, I don't know, The Hobbit. Um, so yeah, it's that's kind of crazy. Yeah, and, and, and it's for me, and those are all exceptional points by, by all six of you about about uh, what kind of defines in gems. I know for me, one of the interesting, most interesting things about this particular panel, when I found I was monitoring is that, you know, I, I'd heard of all of you. I'd read at least some of your works or had heard of all of your works. Um, everyone here, I mean, in my mind, um, you know, and this is just my subjective opinion, uh, your your works are not hidden gems. Like we're gonna get into a bit more what you all think, you know, uh, soon, but I mean, you know, you've, you know, th this is a very highly decorated panel. You know, you've, you've, people here have have uh, placed or finaled or won some major literary awards in both the the uh, self published and traditionally published world. So, 
you know, it was really fascinating for me to say, okay, this is the panel that's talking about hidden gems. These people, you know what I mean? They're, 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 to me, they're pretty well known, but again, it's all relative. So, but that leads me to the, the next question. So um, do you consider any of your own works a hidden gem or do you consider all your works hidden gems that you feel like, you know, um, you, you haven't really uh, gotten the, the reach and the exposure that you normally feel you should have? Um, and 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 why or or why not? Sorry, I had to find the unmute button there. Um, I don't know. I don't know that my books have been out long enough to say whether or not they've become hidden hidden gems or anything like that. Um, they did get. I'm I'm really grateful for the marketing push that they got from my publisher. So I don't want to belittle that in any way. I know. I know a lot of people who've gone into trad pub and did not end up in a situation as good as mine. Um, so I really appreciate the visibility that my books did have, um, especially Hall of Smoke and uh, Barrow of Winter, which I mean, Barrow of Winter is coming out right now. So it's like it's hard to say, you know, how how far it's going to go or anything at this point. Um, but yeah, I'd like to think they're gems and I would prefer that they not be hidden. So. <laughs> I think um, in my case, it's always hard to say that your books are gems, especially when you've written them several years ago and you've grown as a writer and you look back at them and you're like, would I make the same choices today that I made then? You know, and, and that's always a difficulty. But um, but hidden for sure, partly because my debut was May 2020 and there was a decent amount of marketing push and a decent amount of um, getting the book on bookshelves, but no bookstore in the entire nation was open so because of COVID. And so it was a situation where every appearance got canceled like there was no launch party there was no um you like i couldn't even go to the store to like see my book on the shelves like all the others are like here's my photo of my book you know finally on the shelf in my life that um that never happened for me because of covid so it's one of those situations with you know covid and then everybody's like yeah it'll be over and then the sequel came out in um in 2021 and covid was still raging strong so like it's one of those things where where yeah i didn't get i think the traction that um i'd hoped for or the publisher had hoped for for sure because the um the situation you know we were filled with a global pandemic other things were happening and um and so it made it hard to get that kind of visibility so i think so probably like when you said yeah i've heard of all of you i was like mm, me sure so um but but yeah Yeah, I mean, show me a writer who thinks that they are like you know, sufficiently well known. I mean, I'm sure like you, know, Brandon Sanders is there going, where, "Where's my TV series? Like you, know, uh, where, where's my Nobel Prize, whatever." Um, I mean, into my novels, I think I'm doing okay. I mean, I, I, I'm. They're not going to make you know, sort of tear up the lists, but at the same time, as like my, my publisher hasn't dropped me, so that's a good sign. Um, in terms of all the stuff in gems, I mean, I have a huge as a backlog role playing stuff, and some of those have been entirely justly forgotten. Other bits in there, I would love to see some more attention on. But like, role, role playing is, is a very different market to novels because it's a the books are made to be used as opposed to read, like you're, you're, they're games that have to be played, and b it's a bit more. If you have a book, a series with lots of books, it's more sort of a periodical model, whereas people get to get the next supplement, next supplement. So it can be sort of frustrating there to like throw away a great idea, and it's been buried in like you know some obscure D and D supplement, never to be seen again. But the great thing is because people haven't re haven't read them, you can just reuse those ideas. I've gotten like so much stuff out of stuff I wrote like twenty years ago, and just reusing it now. I don't think, um, personally, I don't think my novels are hidden gems. I like to think they're gems. Um, the covers are certainly shiny enough. Um, because they've gotten a solid push from, from like the publisher and stuff. But um, more importantly, I think just the queer community grabbed it and ran with it. Um, and, and, um, and I mean, folks from or descended from colonized or enslaved folks also grabbed it and ran with it, um, which, you know. Um, so basically what I'm saying, I guess, is, is it hit a, a lot of people in the right spot. And so those, I think, are well enough known for now, kind of like Hannah said, I don't, we'll see how, how things go in the future when time has had 
time to do its thing. Um, my short stories, on the other hand, um, a couple of them made like, um, I mean, short stories are always a bit hard because not not as many people read short stories. So they are even like the more hidden of the hidden gems. Um, but, you know, some have, some have been read um, well and some have been like just they just kind of a lot of short stories, not just mine, just kind of like they get published and then into the wind. Um, and so I have a couple stories, like one I published last year, Your Eyes, My Beacon, which I was pretty proud of. Um, and um, my, like one of my very first short stories had like really cool language magic and it's called Burning Season and came out at Podcastle. And so if you guys want to check out those particular hidden gems, I would, uh, you could tell me if you think they're gems or not, you know. Um, <laughs> But but I think I think short stories just have a, a hard time um, gaining traction, um, and there are some there are certainly exceptions to the rule, but they're 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 like there's like one or two a year that you see everybody talk about, and um, I think this year's current one is um, Alex Harrow's uh, Six Deaths of the Saint. Like everybody's heard of that. People I didn't even know knew what a short story was have been talking about it. And um, so I'm excited to see see where those things go, but they just have to hit at like such a particular right time um, to go off. Um, I guess uh, for me, I, you know, like Seal had a good point about the links that you write out to, because I have a couple, I mean, even within my own books that I have out, like, um, I guess I don't know whether my books, like I'm proud of all my books. That's why I put them out. Like I don't, you know, publish stuff that I'm not proud of that I don't think is good enough to be out there and be read by people and liked by people. But um, I guess whether it's a gem or not depends on, you know, what the particular reader thinks about it. Um, but you know, with, with my books, I have like, like Fortune's Fool came out in, in, into Spiffbo and within the indie community. Um, and I think Spiffbo is, has an audience that has grown every year, which is awesome. That was the point, right? It was to grow it every year. And so, um, being a finalist was, was amazing really because so many people that I, you know, I, it was my debut book. I, didn't know what to expect with it. We're picking it up and reading it and talking about it. Um, but the the thing with Spiffo is though that the finals are exciting. Um, you know, everybody reads the books. Uh, they look for new books. They're excited about finding new books. But there's no gap between the end of Spiff one Spiffo and the beginning of another one. And then everybody's on to like the next book. So so it's kind of like the 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 hype is there for a while and then it kind of and then it's new books and, and that's you know as it should be right because we're trying to to promote a community really we're probably trying to lift up everybody's books um so i kind of think of my books are still and like zamil was talking about like um they're still there's a lot of they're undiscovered by a lot of people, which means that I have a lot of more work to do as an indie writer in terms of marketing and trying to find those readers who will enjoy my books. So I guess I, you know, it, it kind of seems like as an indie writer thinking about it is, and I don't, I don't know that I only have this experience because um, as looking at it as kind of a marathon, like the book starts, it comes out and, um, hopefully it's like a, a rolling a boulder, you know, like a, when you're starting out and you kind of roll the boulder and hopefully it'll get to a certain point where you're rolling uphill. I, I don't know an analogy because sometimes it rolls back on you, but like you get it to a certain point where it'll start rolling on its own and it start picking up speed. And that that's always the hope, I guess. Like, um, but, but to like, I have the, um, Fortune's Fool is number one in this series. And then I have a couple of novellas that are related. Um, and those are much harder to market, to tell people about. Um, Amazon doesn't link them 
well you can't number them right in the series you know if it's like a prequel they don't like point fives and stuff like like now there's just starting and when i put them out they really they had no link now that you know you can go and look and they'll put them on the series page but it's it's just a little bit more more challenging and then collecting all those and letting readers know they're all together like i do have like there's a short story in that universe that came out in grimdark magazine last year and um also then in um, the alchemy of sorrow anthology which um did quite well and kickstarter like it surprised us we were so 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 surprised and grateful when that that kind of took off that 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 story is in that universe and trying to collect all the things from everywhere and say hey look this is a body of work um that that can be difficult Uh, yeah, I think in terms of gunmetal gods, uh, most people who read indie fantasy have probably heard of it uh, by now. Um, but I always wonder in the general fantasy community uh, how well known it is, uh, mainly because there's still a stigma against uh, indie publishing in the general readership. And... Um, it's very likely that even the more popular indie fantasy books uh, doesn't doesn't bridge that gap or doesn't get over that uh, that lack of trust that general fantasy readers or general readers have uh, towards self-published books. Uh, so that's something that I always do wonder is how well known is it in the in the general fantasy community? And to be honest, I would say it's probably not that well known. Uh, mainly because it doesn't, it it you know, it doesn't have that publisher push, uh, that that uh, push that, you know, gets it into bookstores and just gets it in in front of people's um, in front of people's faces, you know, in in the different ways that a trad book can sort of uh, ga gain that visibility, um, and you know, that's that's something which I think is. A, a big challenge because in the indie fantasy community we are sort of in this in this walled in this walled space you know where where we are interacting a lot of the time with the same people and we might be thinking that okay we're we're, we're breaking out of there we're, we're becoming more well known but in reality we're still this very tiny drop uh in a much in a much much larger sea um and you know and 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 it's it's just a very difficult thing to to overcome um for for literally everyone in the space and funny funny thing is i think that um uh, maybe even before you know before before one year ago uh probably the story that i was most well known for it is a short story and the reason is because i wrote this horror short story back in 2019 i put it on reddit uh, and then some big YouTube narrator contacted me and asked me if he could narrate the story. So he narrated the story on YouTube and that got over a million views. So that was probably the thing uh, most people, uh, the story most people knew from me for a long time. Um, so, so I still wonder, like, has Gunmetal God surpassed that? Are there a million people who, um, there definitely aren't a million people who've read it, but are there a million people who've heard of it who... Who know the name um that's you know a million is a big number but when you think about the you know the population of the earth uh it's a very small number so um yeah it's, it's a difficult thing to you know to uh to place yourself in in this in these different circles um of popularity of of being well known of being heard of um but as angela said you want to think that you're growing um, and you're you're sort of growing at a certain scale um, where you can become well known. Ev everyone dreams of being a big author, so but but the levels that you have to overcome to get there are, are just massive. So yeah. Well, thank you for some excellent answers, all six of you, to a very difficult question to answer because you know you're essentially assessing your own place in in the the great sphere of of who's reading what and to what degree, and that's not easy. And you know, I know, you know, I don't know you all, you know, that well. I some of them, some of you I know better than others, but you know, I can sense you're all very uh, humble people, and you know, there's a lot of humility there. But at the same time, you're trying to honestly, you know, 
um, assess something that's that's difficult to quantify. So those are some excellent answers. So, um, so just a final question while we're on this vein, you've talked a bit about how you feel about your own work, whether they your some of your works are a hidden and b gems and the combination thereof. But can you all name at least one? I know it's hard. Pick one book, work, short story something that you feel is a hidden gem that deserves more attention from another writer uh, other than yourselves. Can you can you pick one, please? Sal so shaking her head, no, she can't. Uh, picking one is very hard. I don't know, I guess every, every time, I love the books that I love so much. It's hard to think of them as not being as popular, you know, um, but uh, the Bone Orchard is one I enjoyed last year that I don't see. I saw a lot about it like at the time of its release and then it kind of seemed to vanish. Um, so that's one that I loved. It's I don't know how to describe it, but it's like ghosts in a brothel and there's some clockwork magic and I loved it. And I know it's not everybody's cup of tea either. It's like one of those books where you're confused most of the time, but I enjoyed that personally. That would be my hidden gem. <laughs> yeah. So my hidden gem would be um, Wrath Goddess Sing um, by Maya Dean, which uh, came out fairly recently. So we'll see if it's hidden or not. Um, as time marches, it got pretty decent traction at the start. We'll see if that continues. But um, it's a, uh, a retelling of the, um, of the Iliad, where Achilles is a trans woman um, and was written by a good friend of mine. And so um, I always want to give that lift where, wherever I can, because it's, it's hard to get started in this industry. And like, without the people, Actually, like in trad pub like I'm not sure how it is in indie but in trad pub you basically like write these letters these emails off to nowhere um for years maybe decades and then somebody sends you back a response of like actually yeah I want to represent you and you're like that was the 30,000th time there's no way that's real and then if you're lucky enough that a publisher takes your book and publishes it like you have no idea what the industry's actual internal functioning is like most of the time you have no, like, you have nothing. You're, like, just kind of adrift. And without the other authors who, like, come out and give you a hand and, like, write a blurb for you and do things for you, it's really a lonely process. So I think it's important to uplift those um, those new people who are, who are in the industry. So, yeah. No, I was sort of like wandering the bookshelves looking for something that sort of like left out of me as a gem. And what I grabbed onto was a, a, like an author who is actually quite uh, well known, uh, Robert Hunter Wilson. He was the author of Illuminatus and many, many other books. But the sort of the, the gem aspect of it, there's one book of his which is pretty obscure called Masks of the, of the Illuminati. Um, Robert Hunter Wilson is a, he was like best known for doing like books on cons conspiracy theories and sort of these like, you know, um, how do we know that respect? Most of the, his books at this point, they're fairly dated. They were written in the 70s. There's lots of, they were never edited. There's a lot of messy stuff in there. Mass of the Illuminati, though, is basically all the good stuff concentrated into one fairly slim book. Um, the basic pitch is there's this um, British aristocrat who's got involved with the occult. He thinks to be pursued by the devil. He flees to Zurich. He wanders into a bar and with two people there who will who would help him. They are James Joyce and Albert Einstein, who've been drinking for the evening. And basically he tells them a story and they analyze it and sort of solve the mystery of what's really going on. And it just covers so much stuff about the occult, about um, secret societies, about uh, psychology, nature reality, all in like 200 pages while doing pitch perfect interpretation or um, pastiches of Joyce and other writers. And it's just a lovely little book. I still can't really pick just one. In fact, I came with a list and half a stack. I didn't pull off all the books that I could have from the shelves. Um, so I have two books right here and I'm actually not gonna pick either of them, even though I love them very much, um, just because those authors Though I think these particular books of theirs are hidden gems of theirs, I think they themselves are not as hidden. And so um, I would mention then um, Matt Wallace, 
who um, wrote a bunch of novellas for Tor.com, um, also wrote this, uh, this trilogy, this fantasy trilogy about an empire called, um, the, the one, the first book is called Savage Legion and it was so cool and so well written and basically it was one of those kinds of books like where where the characters who live in this city in this empire um start uncovering some of these dirtier secrets about where they live and i can't say too much more about it um without giving that kind of stuff away but essentially um it's a city that takes all of their criminals and puts them in an army to go fight and uh one of the main characters um gets themselves thrown into that um into that military uh of conscripts intentionally another one gets put in there uh because of more devious means and um so it gets more interesting from there but it's just it's one of because i i'm in circles where people talk a lot about colonial anti-colonial types of narratives in fantasy it's just um if you're in that circle a lot of people aren't talking about it and so i feel like it is one of the hidden gems of that that particular narrative slash genre and it's also really great and really funny sometimes and um yeah it's got like an axe queer in it who i just i love i love her so <laughs> Okay, I um, I don't know that I can pick one book either. I have lots of them that I like, but I guess I'll cheat a little bit and pick a series. Um, so uh, Carol Park, Carol A. Park's um, series, The Heretic Gods, which starts with Banebringer and the second book is Cursebreaker. And I love those books and I really would like more people to read them so I can talk about them with other people um because they're just um it's it's epic fantasy with uh with a um with a lot of romance but it's um i would classify it more as romantic fantasy than fantasy romance because it's not it's not like doesn't hit all the formula pieces you know that that kind of go into making a fantasy romance and there are monsters and um they decode ancient languages and it's like you know it's it, it checks all my nerdy boxes and the you know the box and you know i like really like romantic fantasy and it's adventurous and and they are they're not small books but they are super quick reads like i you know couldn't put them down so i really like her stuff she's working on um book three now which she may have to split in two and that's fine with me because i read more about vaughn and yvonne i read as much as she wanted to write about them so um that's that's my my hidden gem is the heretic gods series by carol a park uh, i'm gonna go with this book it's called it's called an altar on the village green by nathan hall uh, i've talked about it a few times on page chewing um so maybe you remember Stuart. um but uh it's a Thank crazy you. book um it's a uh, dark fantasy horror uh, genre mashup book, uh, very heavily inspired by the video game Dark Souls. Um, and I feel like uh, books that are sort of really striking the middle of two genres tend to go, tend to fall into this hidden gem category because um, a lot of times there are just less readers for these kind of genre mashups on, um, but this one does it perfectly. It's it's the best, I think, book I've ever read that combines horror and fantasy. Um, and it's it's a very quick, fast paced, um, like uh, action packed read as well. So it, it, it just kept my attention and I read it in like one sitting, um, but it's, it's, a, it's hidden, you know, nobody, nobody knows about this book and the tragedy when you're when you're when you're an indie author, the tragedy is a small mistake in how you launch or uh, that sets the Amazon algorithm against you can doom you into the hidden status. No matter how good your book is, um, no matter how well it does in Spiffbo, um, no matter how much marketing you do later, 
the Amazon algorithm alone can doom you. So that's that's a tough thing to digest as an indie author. And I've seen it happen to even big indie authors where the Amazon algorithm just dooms them for some reason. Um, yeah, but but this book, uh, I wish, you know, I talk about it whenever I can, and I wish more people would read it. Wow, you guys are making my TBR grown even more than it already is, adding all these these wonderful books. And I apologize, um, you know, I, I meant to give everyone the opportunity to uh, talk about more than one hidden gem. So that's my fault. Just it was just all for time's sake. But uh, still, that was those are some amazing books that that you all got to uh, to talk about. So I think uh, a lot of people are going to be furiously going to Goodreads and adding books to the to the TBR. So. Um, I know we're, we're, we're winding down here, but I, I just want to sneak in another question here for the panel, if we could. What, what, can, what can we do to um, highlight and promote uh, some of these hidden gems? You know, what can we do to, to maybe uh, make them not so hidden anymore? What are the kind of things that we can do to get, get the masses you know, uh, tuned into um, some of these books? You know, I'm sure we have a lot of suggestions here, but you know, what are some of the, the, the things that we can focus on to get, get these books more into the spotlight? Well, the route I took, and I, I particularly took it because I debuted during the pandemic, was I got on TikTok. And book talk became a huge part of my life, huge, huge part of my marketing. Um, I'm a reviewer over there, and I also post about my own work. I tried to do it in two separate accounts, and it just didn't work. So I have one account, and that's where I get to talk about the books that I love and actually have a platform and a voice there. And I also get to talk about my own books and that has been incredible for visibility. It's like, I know there's a lot of hate for book talk, especially on Twitter and stuff like that, but it is an incredibly useful platform. And there is a wonderful community there who has um, a lot of support for a lot of diverse books. You just gotta, you gotta tailor your for you page. There's a search bar, you know, you can find the stuff that you like on there and so that's been my tool. That's my route that I was able to jump on. It was something that I looked at and I thought, I can do this. So this is going to be how I will tackle visibility. Yeah, social media has been very unnatural for me. It's not it's not my um, my native habitat, as it were. Um, and so it's one of those things where I think book talk probably seems like a really, really great idea. Um, and Twitter hating it. Twitter hates everything. So I feel like that's, that's part of the course for Twitter as a platform. But um, but I think um, for me, coming in, actually engaging with people, um, talking to people and been really helpful. I know the pandemic kind of curtailed that quite a bit, but being able to um, to interact with people in person and spread word of mouth has been really good. I use Discord a lot. That's like my social media channel to sort of connect with other people and other authors and indie authors, um, you know, and I think building that community of other of other writers has been helpful. I don't know if it's helpful for, for necessarily getting an audience, but it's been helpful for me as a writer to um, to connect with other people to feel um, to feel more connected to others in the process of writing and to to share some of the ups and downs with, the, with um, you know what it's like to be in the industry. So. Yeah, I mean, like you know, ritual sacrifices to the, to the algorithm seems to be the only solution. I mean, I think the other thing is just like sort of be be aware of, of what's being of like you know, how you're sharing things. Like, um, somebody was talking about like you know, the, short, uh, the short story got picked up by this YouTube person. The like, single piece of my text that's been read with most people is this like little example of play in one book that someone thought was funny, took a screenshot of, and I see it like every few weeks so going around different circles. And there's no attribution on which book it came from, who wrote it. I think it's just a little, like you know, fragment of text floating around the universe. I always think like, yo, if you just put my name on it, or like, yo, just you can take a screenshot with a little bit higher to get the book title in it. It would have been so wonderful. What, uh, well, what might have been? Uh, I mean, I'm. it's not even just social media for me, though that's certainly part of it. Wherever I have a, a moment of platform, I mean, now that I am doing events and stuff, like even this event is the perfect example, but you know, as authors who are being platformed at some time or another, we all will inevitably be asked, what are you reading? What should we read? And I think that's the perfect opportunity to highlight a book that you think isn't getting enough attention. Um, so I usually try to do that. Like, even if I do mention like whatever hot topic book of the moment, I will also try to, to add something that is not 
maybe being talked about. I've been lucky enough to be asked to give us a list of this or whatever. Um, and so I've done that with, with different books. And I think, um, actually, so I, I came, I told you guys I came here early on accident because I can't read time zones. Um, and so I had my camera and everything set up already. So I just said, okay, fine. Um, I'm actually just going to read an excerpt from this book that I love, uh, Winged Histories by Sophia Samatar. And um, so I posted that on my very baby TikTok. Um, <laughs> but so now it's, it's, it's a TikTok and, and on Instagram. And so I, hopefully people will be like, oh, what's this excerpt? And then from there, I actually go check out the rest of, of the book. And I think that's just one of the cool things that you get to do when you have people paying attention to you. For better or for worse. Um, yeah, cause, and I think that there is only so much that we can do as authors, you know, to get our stuff out there, like, you know, as far as like, you know, I can try to get ads to work and I can talk about my own stuff on whatever social platform I can, I can use and stuff. But, but in terms of just being like a reader, like myself as a reader and then readers of our work, like I would just it it matters when people talk about the books like when other people talk about the books that they love and that they are kind of when they're a little bit more adventurous and they kind of go beyond they hear about a new book that maybe doesn't have a lot of reviews or or whatever that and and they read it and then they go and they post about it on you know whatever social media they're on the twitter or 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 i mean tiktok is it really seems to matter a lot now that seems to be pretty big um but or they put a review on goodreads or on amazon you know those those things matter it may not seem like it matters much to like you're just one reader you read a book you liked it and and you know but it it, it does and it it matters it matters to us because it's i think that at the end of the day it's it's going to be word of mouth and social media just kind of magnifies the effect of word of mouth, which is always pretty much how, how people sold books in the past. Yeah, it's uh, for me, I like to think of it as um, exposure multiplied by excitement. So, um, you know, a, a million people might hear about your book, but if there's no excitement behind uh, that level of exposure, if it's not like being advocated by someone who's like really energetic and and really wants other people to read it, um, you know, it might not generate, you know, a, as much of an effect uh, a, as you want. Um, so it, it just like like Angela said, it goes it, it's, it goes down to word of mouth where like when you read a book and you love the book so much, you want to tell people about it. You, you, you first you probably go and tell your friends who are, you know, uh, just the people who you, you normally recommend stuff to. Um, and, you know, I notice when I'm talking to my friends, when I'm recommending them, like whatever it is, TV shows or games or books, my level of excitement is what depend, uh, is the, is the main variable about whether or not they will actually read the book or, or, or watch the movie or whatever. If, you know, it's, it, it all depends on like how much I want to push it to them. Um, and you know, the, a lot of that is, 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 um, when when we when we expand it to wider scales like social media, a lot of it is just human psychology. Like uh, you know, a book might just suddenly get its time in the sun, or it might just suddenly catch fire, and then it goes from being a hidden gem to being you know a well-known gem uh, just through that process alone. Um, but it's a it's 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 like a random thing, you know. It's not it's not guaranteed to happen just because a book is quality. It's it's based on luck a lot of the time, especially on that larger scale, you know. So it's it's a tricky thing, um, but but you know we're as authors we're the ones who should be most excited about our own books. So I think a lot of the time it just starts from there, our own excitement and our own like energy to push our books. Yeah, again, all all fantastic points from from all six of you, and I would just pull a bit on that that thread as well. Um, you know, and leaning definitely into what especially um, CL and Zemil said. Um, I think we all, you know, we all have to admit to some degree, again, based on those points that that were were raised, that 
having a platform gives you a certain modicum of influence. And when you have that modicum of influence, if you're enthusiastic and excited about a certain book that perhaps we consider as under the radar or hidden gem, whatever you'd like to say, then we can affect people's desire to read that book. And sometimes we forget that. We forget how powerful that can be, the power of the mentioned. And we've all seen, I think, um, certain books that, for example, uh, a popular YouTuber, um, you know, hypes up this book and suddenly the next thing you know, everybody's rushing to, to get that book. And uh, it can be as simple as that. It, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, some a review put up necessarily in the book. It can just be a quick mention. And, you know, someone watches that YouTuber, for example, and everybody watches that YouTuber and then suddenly he, he or she mentions that book and then boom, it's, uh, it's taking off. So I think um, that's something that, you know, we really have to be cognizant of that, you know, and, and, and again, the humility part I know comes in that, you know, we don't think of ourselves as influencers, right? But if you have a booktube channel, if you're an author, if, if someone feels that you're speaking with a certain degree of expertise at, on, on a topic, then yeah, that can change people's minds and influence them about, about making choices, making purchasing choices. And that's really, that's really powerful. So we can never underestimate uh, what impact uh, we all here and people uh, beyond this, this chat can have in terms of, you know, um, affecting uh, what people think is a hidden gem versus a non-hidden gem. So I wanted to just quickly touch on 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 another major, just one more major point, as I know that the time is ticking on us. So, have you folks seen um, a hidden gem that has suddenly become not so hidden a gem, and it's become you know it's really it's blown up? And what do you think? Can you nail down what you think the thing was that I know Zemil talked about? Well, sometimes it's just time; it just it just happens spontaneously. It's organic, but. Can you, um, any of you point to uh, any like inciting events that just, you know, it caused this book to just go poof, whether that's a review from a certain reviewer or something that happened to make, turn that book, flip it from a hidden gem. And it may not have been one thing. Again, it may have, it may be just a, a, a succession of things, but can you even think of a hidden gem that suddenly, boom, it, it blew up and and it wasn't, it, it hadn't blown up before. And, and like, what happened to, to turn that around? I can think of one instance, if uh, you don't mind me jumping in. Um, so there's one of my favorite books is called The Trader Baru Cormorant. And it got a bit of a splash when it first came out, but nothing like excessive. Um, but it centers on, a, on a, a secretly lesbian protagonist who is fighting an empire um, through political and financial machinations. Machinations? And, um, but it was a good book but then like quieted and then Gideon the Ninth came out. And I think every book with a lesbian protagonist has Gideon the Ninth to thank right now for whatever success they see. Um, but partly they have a very similar ending structure um, event and everyone started saying, well, one person somewhere started saying, if you've read Gideon and liked it, you need to read this. If you like getting your heart broken here, you need to get your heart broken here. And that I think has given it a completely new life and broadened it, its its audience to um, a queer group of readers who probably would not have just picked up this book um, on, on their own without noticing because it was it was older and um it was it's just it's very very political it's not a lot of hack slash rah 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 um so that's what i can think of for me anybody else just jump in if you if you uh well i think this has happened quite a bit on book talk like in the time that i've been there like i think it was uh when i first was joining was elise kova's books so someone posted a review, went viral, and they sold out everywhere. Um, I think it also happened with Danielle Jensen's Bridge Kingdom books. That happened as well. But Book Talk does tend to be on the romance side. Um, but yeah, it was just one person being genuine and enthusiastic and putting their voice out there. And people watched. And of course, there's a bit of, there's a bit of luck there that, you know, hitting the algorithm, getting it at the right time. Um, but it really is just genuine passion from reviewers and then those reviewers also putting themselves out there and being visible on a platform and 
yeah. Book talk has definitely done that for a lot of books. I'm sure we all know that, but um, yeah, Elise Kova and Daniel Jensen are the two that pop in my mind. Yeah, the one that comes to my mind is Between Two Fires by Christopher Buhlman. Uh, it's a book I absolutely love. Uh, again, it's it's like at the perfect intersection of horror and fantasy. Um, and it was it was published by uh, traditionally at first. It didn't do well. Um, I believe the author got the rights back and then he self-published it. Uh, but what what I think really caused the book to take off was Reddit. Um, cause so many people on Reddit were asking, oh, where, like, are there any horror fantasy books out there? Like where, where can I read horror fantasy, especially medieval horror fantasy? And this book started getting recommended. And then since there are so few books at this intersection, it literally got recommended every time someone asked this question. And I think from there, it just took off. Um, and I don't know the complete story of how it took off, but that's what I noticed myself as a, as a person on Reddit who, who frequents these, uh, you know, forums. Um, so yeah, you know, that's, that's, I think it's, it's pretty cool how, how that happened. Actually, another, another example is, um, I'm blank. Oh, Joseph Bancroft's books of Babel. Cause they went from like, you know, absolutely no one reading the first one to being really big. Um, and that was, that was Mark Lawrence again, wasn't it? Who uh, Sorry, was, highlighted them? Yeah. That was uh, Mark Lawrence again, who highlighted those. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. he was. Yeah. In, in, that's in Spiffo. They have a the Senland Safety Net is named after yeah. his books because he. <laughs> I don't think he even made finalist, but yeah, his yeah. he's the the success story, the big success story, out of Spiffo. They were also very big on book talk, and the the adult fantasy niche. They hit really well. Yeah, um, and I just want to quickly comment about about um, Angela raised an excellent point about, um, and it's great that Gareth brought up specifically Josiah Bancroft's uh, work. That you know, this is two things that this is uh, in the self published milieu now with SBFBO, the self published fancy blog off. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, books that a final or semi final or win the contest that have been uh, picked up uh, almost seemingly by virtue of the fact that they did place somewhere in the in the competition and as a result gotten uh traditional book deals whereby the author perhaps sometimes didn't even have an agent before and um you know it got the attention of the publishers themselves reps of the publishers themselves coming to the authors and saying hey you know you might want to get yourself an agent because we're really interested we like to you know we'd like to to take and essentially take your work from Spiffo, a self-published work and it may be the first in a series some of these authors already had a whole trilogy or a series out and then gotten an agent got a book deal series been pulled republished traditionally and that seems to be becoming somewhat more of a regular thing um you know in in the past and josiah bancroft's his his series was was one of the first that 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 really brought that to light and um you know the whole sedlin uh, rule that Andrew was talking about the ability to have a book that perhaps so this requires some background explaining SBFBO and the, the contest and how it works so it's divided into there's 10 blogging sites that that review um groups these groups of books and then you know they each choose a finalist and if you have a book um in your group that perhaps um, you think may be, you know, a, a really high caliber book, however, may or may not be your choice to be finalist. Whereas another blog group perhaps has felt that they don't have a, a caliber book of that of that ilk. You can actually trade that book off and let the other blog group potentially examine that group that book to become a finalist. So um, you know, and that's it, there's a lot more involved, but I just trying to give some treetop and Angela. Uh, Avi, I think were you there when? So were you? Was that your group, Angela? When, when that uh, when that happened? No, no, that was before I. That was actually um, before I even started coming back and started writing again and coming into indie. So that had happened. I think the year. Oh, I don't even know. I think that had happened the year before because when I came into the indie fantasy community, I was just trying to figure out what was going on. Um, 
he his books were still self-published but he had he was with he was with an agent and then he pulled them all and so when i actually read them they were actually the the traditionally published editions um because i don't know if that was it might have even been 2016 when he did that i don't know but i don't know what the year was but it was definitely a big thing and then now we have a rule in which has actually been used this year in spiffo yes one of the finalists alec hudson's umbral storm was is a finalist because of the Senlin safety net rule yeah yeah there's 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 another one too um but yeah in this in this year this year's um uh, competition but yeah so sorry that's a bit of a tangent but yeah the 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 fact that um again these these books just one major event can happen to change the fate of uh of, of the author in the book as to as to how prominent the book becomes i think it's it's fascinating and and you know i think it's something that you know um again we all have to remember that you know we could be part of that we could have done something or said something that led to something and turn these books into books that are are no longer uh hidden gems or under the radar but turn it to to something much bigger. So um, I want to give uh, everyone an opportunity to kind of round table uh, to go around and, and, and kind of, you know, uh, comment in general, anything that perhaps we haven't touched upon in, uh, in the chat about, you know, what, what things that you think about hidden gems and something you'd like to highlight, um, you know, maybe perhaps maybe you're just adding to something we've already talked about or touching on something new. So I want to give everybody a chance to, to kind of uh, talk about that. So if you have something to add, we'd love to hear from you. I think we kind of have talked around it, but if you're not an author, if you're just like a regular reader or something and you are on social media, or if you're not, just tell people about a book. If you see somebody being like, for the hundredth time, I just, are there any sapphic books? Sapphic fantasy, sapphic adult fantasy, sapphic adult, just like, be the Malazan man. Like, just say, this book and this book and this book, like, like throw out your, your favorite books of the time and you have your hidden gems and somebody else will have theirs. And eventually they might get a list that has more than like the same, whatever, three books and stuff. Um, and I also have to give a shout out to, um, to fan artists. I think that there are, there is one particular fan artist that I, I, probably owe like 75% of my sales to because every time she makes a fan art, everyone's like, oh, what's this book? What's this book? What's this book? I'm buying this book. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like I should just be like writing her a cut of, of things. So if you are artistically inclined and you would like to show your adoration for a book, draw their characters. Um, basically just, you know, whatever your style is, tell people about your favorite books. Um, I, I just want to say that I, as a reader, uh, I tend to look for hidden gems in particular, uh, mainly because I, um, when, when a book gets really, really popular and really, really hyped, um, and, you know, it, it and, and I, I will eventually tend to read that book. A lot of the time I will kind of be disappointed because that book was so hyped up and that book was like so oversold as being like the best fantasy book ever or a book you must read um, that I, at, you know, when I finish that book, um, I will tend to feel that sense of, okay, yeah, it was good, but like, you know, maybe this is just a generally a, a book that fits a lot of people's tastes, but it's not specific to me. It's not like, um, you know, like, like what, you know, I think the best thing as a reader is when I read a book and I feel like, okay, this book was written for me, me personally, like considering all the things that make me different from other people. And that's something you can only really find, I feel, with a hidden gem. Um, and so it's it's a it's a tougher thing to do. It's tough to search through, you know, to go I don't, to go into Amazon and to and to search through a whole bunch of books that that have like under a hundred reviews or something, and to read these reviews and to try to find something that really you think speaks to you. But I think it's worth doing because those like you know I'm I, I've been talking about the this book an altar on the village green. I don't think that has even a hundred reviews yet on Amazon, um, but in the last few years it's one of the few books i can say that i felt was written for me 
so yeah, I feel I want to encourage readers to do that more. Um, instead of just reading the same like three books, you know, like we're talking about Malazan and the private chat, uh, instead of just reading the same like three books, look for the hidden gems, find the book that really speaks to you as an individual. Yeah, just kind of going up with that, just, you know, if you're as readers, just, you know, be be brave. Don't be afraid of a book just because it doesn't have like a lot of reviews. I mean, we talk about like social proof, like, you, you know, books sell better if they have more social proof, but but they have to start somewhere like, you know, so so just because they don't have the number of reviews of some other books doesn't always mean that that's like quality it just means that people haven't discovered them yet you know um and they're, and they're out there they're they're waiting for that one ideal reader like you know to pick it up and go like you know that oh this is this you wrote it for me and and as an author that's that's what we're all looking for we're we're looking to to hit that with readers yeah i really couldn't help <laughs> laughing inside <laughs> when CL talked about the Malzan man, man trope because, um, yeah, like, I mean, I think we all, to a certain extent, a lot of us, we love the under, we love the concept of the underdog, right? We love the concept of, of, of something that perhaps, you know, is not getting that attention and, you know, or someone, someone, a book or an author who you feel that, you know what, they should be recognized. They should be, be, be mentioned more. They should be, you know, love to help bring this person up, um, you know, and, and maybe there's also a bit sometimes of a backlash when you talk about the, the Miles and man uh, trope that, that Teal mentioned about, you know, like sometimes, okay, you know, you can go on Twitter and if you go on a specific day and you, you, you just, just punch and search for Rex, you will see, Malazan, Wheel of Time, <laughs> you know, like the, tr the, the, you'll see maybe instead of seeing, you know, a hundred wrecks, a thousand wrecks, 2000 wrecks, all the top ones will, of different books, the top ones will be the same ones that, you know, again, that, that we a lot of us have either read or certainly heard of. And um, that's not helping uh, to promote a, a, a broad spectrum of books, right? Um, but, Every book, no matter how well read or not, needs that passionate fan base behind them. But they, it, it doesn't even have to be as large, perhaps, as a Malazan, but just that passionate, persistent, you know, pervasive fan base that is always going to get out there and pump those books. And I and I think that alone is going to change, um, you know, how people um, perceive, you know, a lot a lot of books that we think of as being uh, in gems or on the radar because seen it happen and um, you know. And 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 again, you know, there is the lightning in the ball aspect, and there is the you know you get really blessed or lucky or really fortunate, um, you know. But but um, the thing about Hidden Gem is that um, the book is usually already really really good before anybody hears about it, and that's that's the other thing that you know I think we need to really mention is that when we talk about Hidden Gems. These are really 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 good books. It's just that they don't enjoy the wide readership as other books, and we also know, um, contrarily, I'm not denigrating or criticizing any author or any writer don't that's not what we're here to do but you know perhaps you might find that some of the books that people hype up you know and again reading is very subjective you may be like i could pass on this series although everybody's reading it and everybody's hyping up i could pass on this series but this this hidden gem here that's something i really want to read so you know um i think um and i i feel like you know um and i i don't like the word gatekeepers necessarily but but let's let's face some facts here that you know there's certain books that um people may or may not say you need to read those books because they're x right um but that discounts a lot of hidden gems and if you spend most of your time reading every series that is the most hyped up the most well-read series as CEO was talking you walk into Barnes and nobles and you know there's lord of the rings there's miles and there's wheel of time and then there's lord of the rings again then if you spend your if you spend your time just reading those series, you're going to miss out on a lot, right? Uh, a lot of great, great literature. So, um, and I guess maybe beyond that, you know, um, life would be pretty boring if if we just read, you know, everything that, you know, was quote unquote, you know, the most popular thing out there. 
um, you know, life would be pretty, pretty sad. And and then what would be the point of of us all, especially those of us who feel that our works aren't that that well known, writing all this stuff and and hopefully having an audience for it. So, um, but this is this is this is something that the whole hidden gem concept to me is fascinating, and and it's fascinating to hear the the ideas and the thought processes uh, from you folks. They're all you brilliant uh, authors, and you know what goes into hidden gem and and why something is or isn't. Um, I think um, the one thing I want to kind of like the last question I want to to pull on uh, from from you folks is, you know, and I I wouldn't embarrass uh, I'm going to specifically embarrass it not not that you all don't have these moments and just for for ease and sake for me I'm going to embarrass the meal here, in 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 that uh, I remember like to me a Gunmetal Gods for example um, had been had been a book that a lot of people had heard of. Right in the indie community, at, at least I thought it was a pretty popular book, you know. And and then um, I think it was Daniel Green, uh, Zumiel, that that did a, a review of your. And then suddenly, um, I think, and it's up. Zumiel can can clarify this one. That was like the mention, right? I think. And then that really made things just take off from there. Um, but but remembering that, you know, unfortunately, especially for uh, an unknown book, a hidden gem. It can be the opposite. You know, you could get a popular booktuber or a big author or someone saying something negative about your book. And that could potentially, I mean, some people feel that any mention is better, whether good or bad, than no mention. At the same time, that can, you can have books. I, I, I'm not going to name the books, but there's a couple books that I love that, that were great. A lot of people I talked to thought were fantastic books. And then uh, unfortunately, they'd gotten a bad review, a, a more public review, perhaps a bigger book tour, someone that was considered an influencer, and that may or may not have derailed some of the the, the hype or momentum for the book. So, um, do you think that um, something like that can change, can kind of depress something from being read because, unfortunately, um, someone said something not so flattering in the book, someone who is considered an influencer, book tour writer, can that turn something into? like a hidden gem because I know for Zamil, again, I read Gunmetal Gods. I thought it was fantastic. Um, he got that mention. Uh, he had, had a lot of other people saying great things about the book before, but Daniel Green, who was a very popular book, said something, boom, and it was all positive. And it's like, but can it work in reverse? I think it can absolutely work in reverse. I think that um, the idea that it can't work in reverse sort of like we're playing with different dynamics, right? Like if, if you look at something like um, Twitter, where they go their rounds sometimes, especially YA Twitter, and decide that something is something where the author is is horrible for whatever reason, um, and they drag that person, does that depress sales or does that improve sales? Like, I think the, the, the received wisdom is that it depresses sales or that it hurts the author or hurts future future potential for works. But I think um, kind of what I want to say more than that is that I think we need to sort of pull art from success under a capitalist system, because like part of this whole hidden gems thing is like, well, how do we get these hidden gems to make more money, basically to be more successful for the author? And as an author, you want more people to read your book. Like, don't get me wrong. As an author, like, I would love to be sitting in the Brandon Sanderson chair right now where I have um, an underground layer or something that I've built with my book money, that would be fantastic. I would love that, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, like, that's not why I started writing. That's not why I continue to write. And I've found in my artistic journey that like having a genuine connection with another person over something that I wrote means like way more to me than any amount of money that I've received from publishing, especially since like, like unless you are that, ultimate success, that super high success, your financial reward is not as good as the average day job. Like it just, you know, it just isn't like, it, like if you, if you really parse it out for like what you get for an advance over the number of years that it takes to pay it out with the tax rate that you get as a freelancer, um, as a traditionally published author, you are better off being like an, a, a, a poorly paid developer for Amazon um, you know, than you are writing books. And so it's one of those things where I think like, for me, it's been really important to realize like, okay, even though like I got picked up by a publisher and even though I have an agent now and even it's happening, um, looking at those sales figures, like it's not something that 
helps me as a writer. It's not something that helps me as an artist. And as an artist, like I was doing it before I got paid all the time for, you know, 17 years before I got an agent. Like why, why keep going? Like was the goal to get traditionally published? Was the goal to get a million dollars? Was the goal to get um, famous? What was the goal, right? And if the goal was to do the art to begin with, then maybe it doesn't really matter whether there's a lot of success in a, in a capitalist system, so. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Uh, I think to a degree, it depends on if the nature of the review. If like they just like, sort of state the book, I think it's a bad book, that's going to doom it. But we've talked a lot about how hidden gems are often like you know, the answer to a question someone's asking, like you know, where like, you know, where is the Sapphic book? Where is this like you know weird dark fantasy book? I think a sufficiently passionate review of the book that goes like, you know, this is terrible, I hate this, the book is far too weird, it's like, you know, like, one of my favourite views of one of my books is a one-star book going like, you know, was it, I want realistic creatures like elves and, fant and fairies, not these weird monsters. And I would love the review because it, it says like, you know, this book has weird monsters. So people who are going, you go, know, where's the book with weird monsters? And point at that review and go, look, my, my, my one does. So yeah, I think that like, you know, if the review tags things that make that make the gem distinctive, then that can spread it and like you pick, pick up on that. But then again, you'd prefer a positive review that uh, also like those things. I think um, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with where, how visible that review is. So for example, if it's the first review on your Goodreads page, uh, let's say it's like a, a two star review and it's the first review, that can really damage your sales because uh, people who go to your Goodreads page typically will only read like the top few reviews and especially the, the top review. So sometimes you will see that a certain influencer uh, will review a book and their Goodreads review will get like 100 likes, which basically means it's sitting at the top of your book's Goodread Goodreads page forever. Uh, good luck getting it off of their um it's going to be there forever. And it's going to be the first review that people see when they look at the book. And I've talked to a lot of authors who have said that this has damaged um, their book sales and has hurt their book's momentum. Um, and I mean, it is a shame, but it, it, it is the world we live in that certain uh, certain influencers, and this is the same in every in every facet of capitalism, these people have a lot of power and their influ their their opinions will have more power than the opinions of others. And it will steer uh, the direction of a certain line of art in a certain way. Um, so it can happen. It does happen. I know examples of where it has happened. Um, and, you know, go, go to a book's Amazon page and the first review might be a one star review um, and, you know, it, it, it can hurt sometimes uh, as Gareth mentioned, it, it's, it's a one star review, but it could be for something which other people are looking for. Like the, the one I see most is okay. This, this book has gay characters in it. One star. Um, well, that happens to be what a lot of people are looking for. Uh, so, you know, it, but the sad thing is sometimes negativity does rise to the top. Um, and you see this a lot and yeah, it can be hard for authors to overcome that. I think, you know, and, and I guess um, we all know that writing is hard and um, promoting your book is hard and achieving an audience is, is, is also difficult and sustaining success book over book um, is, is difficult. But um, in terms of being a hidden gem, um, I feel it is difficult to, to break through from, from that, that, that if it's a stigma of you know your books under the radar and and make uh, headway into that you know rarefied rarefied air I guess of of not being a, a hidden gem and um, it and even if you have I think it was uh, CL that mentioned if even if you have some books that you consider are not hidden gems and, and are much, you still may have some works that that aren't as well known um, so I think. You know, when we talk about hidden gems, uh, we also need to realize that it's it's not it's not this this linear thing, and um, and beyond that, that you know, um, 
when we talk about books and or writers that are under the radar, um, there may be reasons beyond, certainly beyond the quality of their work. And these are obviously, we're talking about gems, books that are fantastic, that have to do with why they're they're under the radar and, and things like potentially uh, a negative review from a big influencer uh, could be an impact. You know, we don't know all the reasons necessarily behind why something is a hidden gem or not. But I think it's important to remember that, you know, um, it, it very much may a book be a book or books or an author work worth reading. And we all seem to remember that, you know, we have to make those choices for ourselves on what we what we choose to like and what we choose to endorse. And we can't let anyone else do that for us. And I think that's, um, you know, and social media is, is a bubble, um, you know, and there are different, you know, obviously there's different bubbles within social media where some books are get more traction and are more hyped up than other books. And um, that's also something we have to consider when we're, we're thinking of something, well, you know, this book doesn't have the traction. Well, you know, in the, indie, in the indie community, it may be a darling, but no one else may have may have really heard of it outside of the indie community. And those are, and, and that's part of the, the, the challenge with this whole hidden gem uh, concept that, you know, um, it's hard to figure out the spheres of influence and the spheres of notoriety of a book um, you know, whether it's it's really ahead in gem or not. But I think we can all agree that, you know, there's value in reading books that we feel that other people really haven't heard of, but yet the books are really good and other people should have heard of them. I think there's value in that. And I think there's, there's a lot of value when uh, authors such as yourselves um, get behind books uh, that you feel that way about and perhaps uh, can turn the tide and make them into something that's, that's, Holding up there as you know, holding up those books that um that that really need to be uh, spoken of more. So uh, we have five minutes left. I'm just going to leave the floor open to anyone who'd like to add anything else about uh, about hidden gems. So I'll, I'll mute my mic and just kind of again open open uh, open call. I don't have anything especially magic to say um, other than I do talk about a lot of books that I read over on Twitter. So if you want to find me there, I'm at C underscore L underscore underscore C L A R K. Um, and yeah, I talk, I talk about a lot of books. Also shameless plug, but The Unbroken is on sale on Amazon US for like $2.99. So if you haven't gotten it yet, you should get it. It's only today. Uh, yeah, I'm also on, I'm on book talk. I'm talking about my favorite books. I'm posting every day. Um, I'm at HM long books over there. Yeah, maybe guess, I guess everyone can also, and that's, that, again, I was remiss while we're doing that, that everyone can also mention that hasn't already where we can find you, your preferred social media platform, et cetera. So. Yeah, uh, I'm on, actually, well, I was on Twitter, so I still am, I'm trying to move off it as Mythholder, also there, uh, Mythholder at Mastodon.ie, uh, or garhanrahan.com is a lot easier to find. Um, I'm also on Twitter as Angela Board. Most places you can find me as Angela Board. I, I'm i trying to move on to other social media platforms, but it takes me a long time to do these things. So, um, But I'm also on Goodreads. Uh, if you follow me there or friend me there as Angela Board, I do keep track of all my reading there. And I try to do reviews on books that um, I'm reading, especially if they don't have a lot of reviews. Um, I like that, but you know, I, I read pretty widely. I read a lot of nonfiction when I'm writing to try to, you know, prime the creative juices. But I also do try to read a lot of indie fantasy, and I do try to re review what I what I what I'm reading. So, and I'm always looking for new books. Yeah, I'm on Twitter uh, at Zamaktar. 
Um, I'm on all the other ones as well, but that's the one I'm most active on. And I, I talk about books that I read and I talk about like um, uh, hidden gems as well, especially uh, in the indie sphere. Um, I'm trying to get more into book talk too. I'm experimenting with that. So uh, I might have to ask for some tips, Hannah. Happy to. <laughs> Yeah, book talk sounds exciting. I'm on um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram primarily, um, and and not a lot. Though I may send you like a cute red panda video or something on Instagram if um, if you're if you're following me there. So um, yeah. Okay. Well, just wrapping up as quickly. Oops, sorry. See. Oh no, I was just gonna say I I forgot I am on TikTok sort of at at C L Clark writes. At Seal Curry. fantastic. Um, so, I, first of all, I'd love to thank you all for mm -hmm. joining us on this panel. It was phenomenal, fantastic. Um, I'm sure everyone listening, I got a lot out of it. I know I did. Uh, quickly, I'm uh, at PL Start Writes on Twitter. That's my preferred social media platform. And uh, for, but I am uh, one of the co-hosts of Page Chewing, where we try to feature um, authors, creatives, people in the writing community, and particularly a lot of under the radar authors and their books. So I think we're all doing our part uh, here on, on this panel and beyond to try and uh, bolster uh, the profile of another rare books. And I think we're all going to continue to do that because it's important to us. And 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 I, I, I'm i just so honored to be on this panel. Fantastic. It was great to talk to you all. You're fantastic. And uh, hopefully we'll be all getting to talk again soon. And uh, once again, thanks to Adrian Gibson for facilitating uh, this panel of TBR.com about in Gems of Fantasy. And uh, thanks again, everyone. And we'll talk to you soon.